historical significance of this conference um, at this point? Well, it's, it's fairly generally acknowledged that the uh, 500th anniversary of the Christopher Columbus voyages uh, would be a time of historical reflection on the history that has been written about it and the legacy of that history. Uh, and there have been a great deal of uh, concern in the world for correcting the myths and the outright lies that have been written about this history. I mean, principally the issue is that uh, rather than discovering America, uh, Columbus invaded America, and uh, that led to genocide against the indigenous peoples here. The significance of this conference, because there are many conferences throughout the world, but the significance of this one is that it represents the linkage between African peoples and the indigenous peoples. Because in addition to the genocide against the indigenous peoples in this hemisphere uh, was the introduction of uh, the enslaved Africans uh, and the brutal uh, experience uh, of slavery uh, that in its own way represented a form of genocide. Uh, and this conference is bringing together blacks, uh, indigenous people from this hemisphere, uh, Latinos from different countries, uh, people from Africa, people have flown here from Europe. And the central focus is common problems, common solutions. So we're talking about not only understanding the, the correct history or the, the actual experiences, but we're talking about setting an agenda so we're talking about summing up the last 500 years, but setting an agenda so that the next 500 years represents uh, greater forms of resistance and greater motion toward liberation. Okay. Um, let's talk about this agenda. Um, let's say uh, for this coming decade, uh, mm -hmm. the 90s, what do you see as the uh, central themes of, of the agenda for, for resistance? Well, I think that uh, clearly the economic revolution that has occurred in the world, uh, particularly when viewed from the standpoint of technology, uh, up until very recently, until near the end of the 50s, uh, technology has been uh, labor-saving. The introduction of technology has made it easier for people to work. Uh, what has happened as a result of computers and robotics and uh, the new technologies of biology and chemistry and so on is, is that now we have labor replacing technology. What has happened as a result of this technological revolution is a social and economic polarization of society. So a small number of people have gotten wealthier and wealthier and a very large number of people have gotten poorer and poorer. This is not a cyclical crisis of capitalism. This is not boom, bust, boom, bust. This is a permanent crisis. This is a revolution. And therefore, this polarization uh, means that the, uh, because of the impoverishment of people, the agenda item, the central agenda item for the 90s is survival. But here's the key. The key is this. To survive under conditions of absolute impoverishment requires something more than the old reforms. Survival in the 90s is going to mean putting social revolution on the agenda. Um. Let's, um, let's get into uh, a little more concretely uh, discussing what this technological revolution means for different sectors of society, um, let's say African Americans or Latinos um, who do not have, the, they're not computer literate, I mean, they're hardly literate at all. Yes, well, the, the, the main point is this. For example, in the first half of the 20th century, the majority of black workers were in the South in agriculture. Uh, after World War II, a new machine was introduced, the mechanical cotton picker, which essentially liquidated the demand for black workers in the field, which of course resulted in massive waves of migration uh, to the city. Uh, when people moved to the city, it was still possible with few skills to go into factory work and to make a decent wage. Uh, and it was uh, factory work in the core of the Midwest uh, 
in Michigan, in, in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, that meant that these migrants from the rural south uh, could move into the industrial workplace and make a reasonable wage. And with two people working, it was possible to own a home, to own a car, to send your kids to junior college, if not four-year college. And it was almost certain that their lives uh, would mean more education and better jobs than their parents. With the liquidation of these factory jobs being replaced by com robots and computers, that means that you've got the reversal so that rather than children expecting to lead better lives than their parents, in fact, they're going to lead worse lives than their parents. And the parents are now permanently unemployed. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a fiscal crisis of the state, which means that the uh, increased debt that the government has uh, incurred as a result of foreign investment and as a result of a lack of an investment in the transformation of this economy by the U.S., uh, what you've got is a decreasing um, amount of resources available to the government. Uh, they've attempted to balance the books first and primarily by cutting services to the people in the country, cutting the welfare programs, cutting the social insurance programs. Therefore, not only do you have people becoming more uh, marginalized in the economy, you are taking away the safety net of the government at the same time so that the crisis becomes uh, highly political. See, it's not just an economic crisis, but with the government taking away all of its social insurance. Now, there's one other piece of this puzzle, and that is, is that because the um, economic conditions and the social conditions are getting worse, the one area in which the government is increasing its investment is in the area of police and prisons. So in order to control those communities that have been marginalized in the economy and have been made desperate because of the cut in the welfare budget, you have more and more police. And so you have a rise of police uh, of violence in the community. We all know about Rodney King uh, in California, but I mean, that story can be repeated in virtually every major city in the country. Recently, the case in uh, Detroit is a good example of that, where a man was beaten to death by two police. Now here's what's interesting about that. The fact of the matter is, is that those two policemen that beat that man to death were members of the stress squad that existed before the election of the black mayor. And while the stress squad was um, demobilized, those same policemen that had been involved in murdering black people before Coleman Young was elected are now still on the police department. <laughs> So that uh, I was just told, for example, there was a demonstration of workers in front of the state's attorney's office, and the chant was, give us the warrant and we'll serve it. In other words, people more and more are seeing that because there's economic crisis, because there's no uh, consistent and developing welfare policy to protect their interests, and because there's increased police violence, that there's going to be a need to have a political program in which they begin to take control of their own communities and take control of their own destiny. Because they can't control, they can't count on the businesses to employ them, they can't count on the government to provide them decent uh, health care, uh, welfare and housing, and they can't uh, count on the police to protect them, rather they look to the police to brutalize them. Now when you take other sections of the population, I mean if you take the Native American community, the Native American community in this country certainly has been betrayed over the history uh, from the invasion, uh, the use of disease to depopulate their community, uh, to the uh, betrayal of all the treaties that were signed. We now have in effect an apartheid policy where we've got uh, basically reservations which are like the homelands in South Africa. Uh, where you have the concentration of some of the most intense poverty and suffering in the entire country. I mean, an example uh, would be um, like tuberculosis. The highest rates of tuberculosis are among the native population in the country. The highest rates of alcoholism. Now, we know alcoholism was introduced by the uh, colonial expansion from Europe as a tool for control. No different, really, than opium in China or heroin uh, in the black community or now crack cocaine. It's the same use of, um, of drugs uh, to control the population. We think that this Christopher Columbus um, uh, protest, this resistance against the lies and distortion of history, has really brought, I think, through this conference and through other mechanisms, really brought an appreciation uh, for unity.
with the uh, Native Americans, the Indian peoples. Uh, we've got, for example, in this conference later today, a, um, a slideshow showing the unity between the African peoples and the Indian peoples in this country by a man who wrote a book called Black Indians. Uh, and and we want to we want to build on this uh, because um, yes there aren't as many Native Americans as there used to be but the integrity and the um, uh, the historical basis of our future society has to be based on uh, on uniting with the indigenous people of this country. Uh, to keep forever in the forefront uh, that we are trying as best we can to correct the past 500 years of, uh, of genocide and, uh, and lies and distortions. So we see this unity between Africans and Native Americans is absolutely essential uh, to the future of this country. Now, of course, um, there are many Indian peoples. This is one people. There are many peoples. And um, we've tried to, to incorporate uh, culture as an expression of the bonding and unity that we need to, to have. We've attempted to look at politics from the different parts of the country. Um, the people from California have one set of issues. The people of upstate New York, another set of issues. Florida, another set of issues. And we're trying to not uh, be so general that we miss the reality of the different communities we're working with. Now, when it comes to the uh, Latinos, um, and really we should say more, the people from Mexico and the, and the Mexican-Americans, people from Puerto Rico, uh, and so on, uh, we see the need to uh, hold up the political goals that people have. I mean, an example is uh, Puerto Rico's a colony, and, and, the, and, the, and the question of uh, an end to colonialism is a, is a point of unity in the world. So we want to keep in front of people this fight against colonialism and the, and the question of independence for Puerto Rico. We want to keep in front of people uh, the fact that not only do we want to support the economic development of Mexico and support the quality of life of the Mexican worker, at the same time we want to prevent the ruling class of this country and the ruling class of Mexico to, to, to come together in common opposition against the working class in Mexico and the working class in the United States. In other words, with this new trade agreement, when companies move to Mexico, yes, Mexican workers are going to get a job at a dollar an hour, et cetera, but the fact is, is that the level of exploitation will far exceed even the level of exploitation here. But here what will happen is because they've moved companies to Mexico, the quality of life and the standard of living of the American working class will decline very dramatically. So here again we have uh, not only what I was saying before, about unemployment. Here we have a reduction of quality of life of people who will even be employed. So now if somebody's making 17, 16, 15 dollars an hour, they're going to start working for half and less of that because otherwise they'll lose their job to someone in the third world. So I think no matter what section of the population you look at, you've got these three problems. You've got the problem of economic crisis because of the technological revolution. You've got the problem of a social crisis because of a cutback in the social safety net of the, of the government. And you've got the third problem of the increased use of police and prisons to control people so that when they begin to move in their own interest to take control of their communities, that they are effectively repressed by the police. Um, one of the problems facing um, our communities is um, an enormous amount of tension and um, infighting and, and people basically, um, you know, uh, killing each other, uh, be it uh, within the black community or, or within, uh, between uh, uh, African Americans and Latinos. Um, could you shed some light on, on why is this happening? Well, you know, one of the um, ways in which uh, oppression works, and I, and I learned this uh, not only theoretically but, but practically in my own experience, but I learned this theoretically in, in something that Franz Fanon, the uh, psychiatrist, the, the political activist from Martinique wrote. And he said, you know, one of the objectives of colonialism is that instead of having to put people in prison, you put the prison in them. So that part of the process of oppression is to create in people the kind of consciousness which is self-negating. 
and to create in people the kind of hostility toward others. So that one of the most common things around the world among oppressed people is, is that they take out their anxiety and their feeling of frustration on each other. There's always a uh, rise in domestic violence where within families people have violence. Within communities, people have violence. And different communities that are oppressed across racial lines or across religious lines or across uh, nationality lines are in conflict with each other. And I think that in, in this country, we've got this uh, game that's played uh, on the hierarchy of suffering and that uh, uh, blacks are tricked into believing that they have to rationalize they're uh, being more um, uh, harmed and more uh, violated than someone else. And the Latinos are being told that uh, they're going to be the new uh, minority and that they have to fight isolated from blacks for more affirmative action or for more jobs. And the blacks have got theirs, and now they need to have uh, their share. When in fact, uh, as in this conference we're putting forward is the notion of common problems, common solutions. What I often say is, is that it's like this example. If you've got four people sitting in a dentist office and everybody's got a toothache and the discussion comes up as to who is experiencing the most pain, there's no resolve to that con uh, a conversation. The only resolve is for everybody to realize that they all have a problem. They all have a toothache. There's no way to determine the hierarchy of pain. And so we've got this system that attempts, us, attempts to get us to do that. And what we're doing in this conference is an attempt to see that there's more commonality uh, in, in our suffering. And therefore, there can be some commonality in our resolution uh, of the suffering. Uh, I might relate this also to the sense of history that we're talking about. You see, ultimately in this conference, what we're trying to get at is not simply the history of our particular groups, but we're trying to contribute to in the future what will come to be known, I think, as the history of humanity, which doesn't privilege one group against another. And, and that is ultimately a project uh, that uh, we're fighting for. Uh, and in our communities, when we are able to address this question of the violence that the oppressed commits against itself, then it seems to me, in political terms, we'll be reorienting ourselves to begin to understand the common history of humanity that we have to build. Uh, I think that in this country, on a political level, the unity between blacks and Latinos is the critical unity to build progressive politics in the city. Every elected official that has been progressive has been uh, elected on the basis of the Black Latino Coalition as the center of a broader coalition. Uh, now on the other hand, every time that blacks and Latinos have had conflicts, then that has prevented any progressive politics from developing. Let me ask me, where do we go from here? OK, so where do we go from here? We've had a very successful conference. Before it's over, well over 1,000 people will have come through this conference. There are many events planned in the immediate future. Uh, we think that conferences will have to be uh, a matter of lifestyle. In the 60s, in the 30s, whenever there's been a political motion, political progress, people have always come together to talk and debate. We think we're going to have many more conferences in the future. But what we want to do is have a new kind of conference where people are absolutely clear when we come together in a conference, what comes out of that conference is some forms of collective action, common problems, common solutions. Now, in the immediate future, what we're talking about is taking the whole debate around Malcolm X, 
a whole discussion around Malcolm X and connect that not simply to the abstractions of what Malcolm believed, but to the concrete motion of the 90s in the struggle for survival. So for example, in this conference, we've got activists, homeless activists, activists around the crisis of welfare, activists around hunger, activists, youth in, in schools. So what we're talking about is uh, on every Thanksgiving, the homeless and the hungry are going to be mobilized along with the indigenous population of this country uh, to take over abandoned buildings, uh, to force the country to face the crisis it has uh, in its own morality and its own hypocrisy on days such as Thanksgiving. We're going to have mobilizations of poor people on every uh, holiday time uh, when there's traditional gift giving to again to confront the, the, the accumulation of wealth and greed in this country that dominates public policy and public life. And we see the, uh, the 90s being a time of great struggle. And as I said before, the principal agenda item is survival. But in a time of economic crisis, survival means placing social revolution on the agenda. Thank you. Wonderful. Great.